All right, well, let's welcome up our very own Hutch. Sir, can take that with you. Good morning, men. It's good to see you. If you have a Bible, find your way over to the book of Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19 as we begin our journey today, and we kind of set the table for where we're going to be in the study of the Ten Commandments. Uh, USA Today did a poll not too long ago, and they discovered that 60% of Americans could not name five of the Ten Commandments. However, 74% of Americans could name all three stooges. 35% could name all six kids in the Brady Bunch. 25% could name all seven ingredients in the McDonald's Big Mac. But only 14% could name all 10 commandments. So I want you to take out a pencil and a pen right now. And I want you to write down all, no, we're not going to do that. It's not uh, the quiz, but, but I do want you to know this, that before the end of this series, I hope that far more than 14% of us here will be able to name all 10 commandments. But more importantly, that we'd be able to live out all 10 commandments and everything that God has for us. You know, for many Americans, the Ten Commandments are not carved in stone. For many Americans, the Ten Commandments are merely written down in pencil and there's a huge eraser nearby. The Ten Commandments have influenced our nation and the laws of other nations more than any other single document. Listen to what Ray Fowler writes, and I quote, They have been a positive good whenever nations have enforced them and people have followed them. Whenever nations and people have disregarded them, it has only meant moral and societal decay. James Madison, the fourth president of the United States and the founding father who has given the title the father of the American Constitution said, and I quote, We stake the future of this country on our ability to govern ourselves under the principles of the Ten Commandments. On June 25th, 1962, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that school-sponsored prayer was unconstitutional in the case of Engel versus Vital. One year later, that very same U.S. Supreme Court disallowed Bible reading in public schools in the case of Abington School District versus Shemp. In 1980, the United States Supreme Court ruled that posting of the Ten Commandments would no longer be tolerated in the public schools in the case of Stone versus Graham in the state of Kentucky. Think about this. We have taken prayer, Bible reading, and the Ten Commandments out of the public square, and we've replaced it with target practice for the immoral and godless of our society. This morning, I want you to rewind with me very quickly, 3,500 years. Back in the day, how did God give us the Ten Commandments? We pick up the narrative in Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, on the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. It's been 60 days now, two months, since the Israelites have been led under Moses' leadership out of Egypt, out of bondage and slavery. Of course, God miraculously did that. And what is amazing to me is, is that God could take the nation of Israel out of bondage in the land of Egypt in one night. But it would take him 40 years to get Egypt out of of Israel. Verse 2. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. And we look at and we reflect on Moses' story. We think that, well, Moses, he went up to the mountain and got the Ten Commandments, right? One trip? Well, you remember the fact that 40 days later, after going up into the mountain, Moses came back down in the mountain. He saw a fiasco going on, and he ended up taking the Ten Commandments, the two tablets that God had given him, slammed them to the ground in anger, and they broke. 
So we know that he went up a second time and God told him to hew out the tablets and he would rewrite those 10 commandments for him. But literally, when we study the text, we see that Moses went up to God seven different times. The Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. For all the earth is mine, in case you were wondering, it's his. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Verse 7. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, would you read this next line with me from your bifold? In the quotes. Are you ready? This is what Israel responded. Let's read this together. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Let's read that again. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Just in case you missed it, let's do that one more time. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That was Israel's response to Moses when Moses delivered God's message to his people. And Moses reported the words of the Lord of the people to the Lord. Now, we got to stop here for just a second because it's pretty easy to obey God when things are going your way. When you're rolling downhill and picking up steam, it becomes slightly more difficult to obey God when God says, I want you to do this and something inside of you called the flesh rises up and says, I, 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 I don't want to do that. It gets a little more difficult to obey. Knowing this, God does something very, very special for the Israelites to help them to keep the promise that they're making on this day. Go down to verse 10 with me, if you will. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Fast forward, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. Immediately after this, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Now, why did God put this attention-grabbing show on for the Israelites? Did he do that so that he could intimidate them into obedience? No. Did he do that to boost his ego? No. Absolutely not. But God did do this for the benefit of the Israelites. You see, God decided to give the Israelites just a small glimpse of his holiness here on Mount Sinai so that he could put the fear of God in their heart in the hopes that that would help to motivate them to fulfill the promise we just read. Now, that very same dynamic exists for us today. God wants us to obey him because we love him. God wants us to obey him because we could not imagine 
breaking his heart. But God also understands that there are times when that old, ugly, sinful nature rises up inside of us. And it comes against our passionate pursuit and desire to obey God and takes us to the very precipice of disobedience. And so it is in those times that God wants to give us the motivation of the fear of God. Now, I know what you're thinking. Hutch, I'm a successful businessman. Have been for decades now. This, this fear of God thing, come on. That's, a, that's an Old Testament thing, right? That's an under the law thing. We're under grace. Well, before you carve that thought into stone, I want you to listen to something that Jesus said. Look at it here so you can see it for yourself. Luke chapter 12 and verse number five, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Now, who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about God. Look with me, if you will, at Hebrews chapter 12, where the writer of Hebrews chapter 12 is reflecting on the events that took place in Exodus chapter 19 that we're looking at this morning. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, the Bible says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Circle, highlight, underline. Worship God acceptably with reverence and fear. For our God is a consuming fire. If you and I are going to be wise followers of Jesus Christ, we must learn to live our lives in reverence and awe of the one true living God. So God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments, but why? What was his purpose in giving the Ten Commandments? Well, there's two purposes that I can see from the scriptures that God gave us the Ten Commandments. And that's gonna help us this morning to set the table. So thankful for the guys that came in last night and set these tables up and set these chairs up and earlier today set the bifolds and the pins out and the table markers. They were preparing us preparing for us to sit at the table of God's word. And that's what we're doing in today's message. We're setting the table for this journey of why we're going to study the Ten Commandments. So you might want to write this down. God's first purpose in giving us the Ten Commandments is to make every person alive aware of what a sinner we really are. God's first purpose in giving us the Ten Commandments is to make every single solitary person alive aware of what a sinner we really are. Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul writing this great theological treatise. Verse 7 says this, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. Paul says, listen, the law is what helps me to understand what sin is, verse 22, Romans 7. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. It brings me joy. It's, it, 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 it's, it's a delight to me. But notice what verse 19 of Romans 7 says. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Paul says, I got a problem here. No matter what I want to do, I just can't in and of myself keep all 10 commandments. I see, simply keep breaking them over and over and over again. And Paul says, this forces me to come to a dreadful conclusion. And the conclusion that it forces me to come to is this. God's law, God's 10 commandments are holy and righteous and just. They're God's plumb line for this life. And since I can't keep them, there must be something wrong with me. And that's exactly the point of the Ten Commandments. 
to help us see ourselves and the truth about ourselves. Put another way, without a perfect standard of righteous behavior, and that's what the Ten Commandments is, to compare ourselves to, you and I would never ever fully realize just how deeply and thoroughly sinful we really are. Again, look at what the Apostle Paul writes, Romans chapter 7, verse 5. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. Remember, there's a scripture that says, for the wages of sin is death. But look at what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3 in your notes. Paul says this, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Do you remember that old Michael Jackson song, The Man in the Mirror? Somebody want to sing it for us real quick? Nah, I don't. Listen. That's what the Ten Commandments is for. It's so that every single one of us look into the mirror and see who we really are. And when we honestly begin to take a look like this at ourselves, that man in the mirror, we'll see we're not just a little bit off in keeping the Ten Commandments. The truth of the matter is, is we will see how Dreadfully sinful we really are in the sight of a holy God. And it was this process of self-discovery that caused the Apostle Paul to cry in Romans seven twenty four, what a wretched man I am. That's not a word we use a whole lot anymore, is it? Wretched. Paul, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. <clears throat> this is a conclusion about ourselves that we really don't want to come to, isn't it? We don't want to really deal with it. We don't want to face that in the mirror. As a matter of fact, the rabbis of Jesus' day didn't want to face it either. Now they wanted to hold up heirs in front of people so what they did was, is they basically watered the Ten Commandments down. They lowered it down to their level, if you will. You say, Hutch, how did they do that? Well, here's how the rabbis in Jesus' day did that. They would say something like this. Well, you know, I have never actually killed someone. I have not physically put an end to their life. Therefore, I have kept commandment number six. Or they would say something like this. Well, I have never actually physically slept with another person other than my spouse. So I have technically never, ever, ever, ever broken commandment number seven. But do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter five? Jesus raised the ante just a little bit. Look at what he said. Matthew 5, verse 22. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Verse 28. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery worth with her in his heart. Now maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, by that definition, by Jesus' definition... I gotta be honest with you, I have broken the Ten Commandments tens, hundreds, thousands of times in my life. And that's the whole point. That's the whole point. The job of the Ten Commandments is to bring every single one of us to the point to where we say, okay, now, now I understand. Well, what do I understand? Well, number one, I understand that I stand condemned as an incurable sinner before a holy God. Number two, I have no hope of ever satisfying the demands of the Ten Commandments on my own. Number three, 
I understand that I have no hope of ever working my way into heaven left to myself. And number four, I understand that I need some other way to get into heaven that doesn't depend on me, on my works, on my keeping the Ten Commandments, on my religious activities. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote to us in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 21. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ must be given to those who believe. Here's the truth. Because sin permeates every single part of me and every single part of you and every single part of every person who has ever lived. Because when we compare ourselves to the Ten Commandments, the holy and righteous standard that they present, the Ten Commandments condemn us as guilty. Thank God that's not the end of the story. Here's the end of the story. Galatians chapter three and verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us. The law was given to point us to Jesus. When I understand how utterly sinful I am, that I cannot keep God's law, God's commandments, in God's standards. I realize that about myself. I also realize I can't get to God on my own. So the 10 commandments is the schoolmaster, if you will, that points us to Jesus so that we indeed might be pronounced righteous, forgiven, Justified, cleansed. How? By all of my good works? No. By keeping the Ten Commandments we've already established, we can't do that. How? By faith in Jesus Christ and what he accomplished for me by his death on Calvary's cross. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So when Jesus became a curse, he did it to take my curse. It's the great exchange. My guilt, my sin, my curse. He says, Hutch, here's the deal. I'll take it all. Every single sin, every ounce of shame, And I will replace it with my grace, with my forgiveness, if you will. Trade me with it. Just simply believe. We say that salvation is free. I hope you see that it's free to you and me. But it cost God everything. And a high price was paid. So this morning, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm not talking about just intellectually pursuing him. I'm talking about there's come a point in time in your life when you made this exchange, God's righteousness, holiness, perfectness for your sin 
and disobedience. God's purpose, his first purpose behind the Ten Commandments has already been fulfilled in you. You say, well, Hutch, if God's purpose for the Ten Commandments has already been fulfilled in me, why in the world do you want to spend 10 weeks studying it? Well, you remember I told you at the beginning there was two purposes, right? Notice if you will, I, don't, I skipped over this verse and it's such a powerful verse, I don't want to skip over it. Look at Colossians 2 and verse 14. Get this. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us, oh, let that sink in, with its legal demands, this he set aside, how? Nailing it to the cross. So if the Holy Spirit, if the, if the Ten Commandments have already done their job in me, why do we need to study them? Well, there's a second purpose. Not only is the purpose of the Ten Commandments to show us that we can't keep them and that we are sinful, Once we come to faith in Jesus Christ, that's dealt with. That purpose is done. But the second purpose why God gave us the Ten Commandments is because in this present day, they teach us how to live the blessed life. They teach us how to live the blessed life. You see, when you operate your life by God's design things go much better. And it doesn't mean that difficulty and tragedy are not coming your way. But what it does mean is when you're in the midst of a storm of tragedy and trial, there's another fourth man in the furnace, if you know what I'm saying. The God of all creation is with you in the boat. He's through it all. He's there with you. If you take your truck and you don't pay attention to the owner's manual whatsoever and you just drive that thing however you want to and you drive it so hard and in so many difficult places and run that thing into the ground, who's to blame for that? But when you operate it the way that the designer designed it, it'll purr like a kitten and do everything that you need. Every one of the Ten Commandments is restated in the New Testament except for the Sabbath, and we'll cover that when we get there. But what that means is, is this, guys. We can't discount the the Ten Commandments as an Old Testament thing, an Old Covenant thing. Because the truth of the matter is, is they are applicable to us today. That means that the Ten Commandments are timeless, cultureless, non-negotiable principles for godly living. And that's why we need to study them. We're not going to study him as God's measuring stick, pointing in condemnation to us because we've already illustrated. He's already taken care of that. But what he does is he gives them to us so that we can live the genuinely blessed life that he has for us. You say, well, Hutch, that's great. But how does that affect me? Well, here's how it affects you guys. When you understand how great of a sinner you were and how gracious of a forgiver God is, that ought to motivate you to want to live the blessed life. When you and I understand that we have tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of infractions of God's law against us, that ought to help us to understand how much mercy God has extended to us and how much grace. We don't like to hear that we're hopeless, helpless, separated from God but not until we fully realize, understand who we were, can we fully appreciate who we are because of what God has done for us. We're gonna break through the tables, hopefully have some interaction and discussion that'll take us to another level. Then I'll come back and wrap it up in just a few minutes.
My hope and my prayer as we walk out of here today is that we would genuinely be humbled by what we have studied. It reminds me of something the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 3 and verse 27. He said, then what becomes of our boasting? Is it excluded? By what kind of a law? By the law of works? But then notice what he says here in this next text I have written down for you. Galatians 6 and verse 14. But far be it from me to boast, except, circle, highlight, underline. Paul says, I don't have anything else to boast in except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Because when you and I truly and genuinely understand the degree of our sin and disobedience, when we understand that there is absolutely positively no room for pride, arrogance, haughtiness, or hubris, the only thing that there is room for is humility and gratitude to God for doing what we could never ever ever, ever do on our own and for ourselves. And as followers of Jesus Christ, as men of God, we are called to live differently than the way our world lives. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said, Romans chapter 12. He said, do not be conformed, do not be poured into the mold of the ways, the philosophies of this world. But rather, instead of, be transformed, metamorphosized, changed. How? By the renewal of your mind. The world says, this is the way to go walk in it. God says, no, this is the way to go walk in it. And when you spend so much time in the ways of the world, you cannot be following in the ways of God. But if you will spend the time in the pursuit of the ways of God, the things of the world will pass away. God calls us to reject all the arrogance of our fleshly sinful nature and to live in true humility and realizing in humility how ugly my sin is before a holy God and then realizing all that Jesus has done for me. John Newton wrote probably what is the most beloved of all hymns, Amazing Grace. But John Newton didn't start so well. He had a very tough upbringing, which led to a, a hard life. He was a slave trader. He would take a ship and go to Africa, separate men from their wives and children and families, put them in the hull of a boat in the most inhumane of conditions and sail across the ocean Usually half of his cargo died in transit before they ever reached the shores on this side of the ocean. He was a vile, profane alcoholic. The worst of the worst. 
And yet God began to deal in his life. And one day, while walking the streets of Edinburgh, he heard a man by the name of George Whitfield preaching in an open air meeting. And God used those words to bring John Newton to faith in Jesus Christ. And there was no doubt about the change. Because this once vile and profane man went on to become a pastor and a leader in the great awakening that took place during the days of Wesley and Whitfield in England. In his last days, he lost nearly all of his memory. He could no longer preach. He could barely hold a conversation. But on his deathbed, he said these words, I can only now remember two things very clearly. One, that I am a great sinner, but that Jesus is an even greater savior. That's why the apostle Paul said, if you're going to boast, boast in all your good works. No. No. That's why the Apostle Paul said, if you're going to boast, boast in your great accomplishments. No. That's why the Apostle Paul said, if you're going to boast, boast only in the Lord. Father in heaven, it is our prayer today that as we leave this time together, you would give us a great understanding of what incurable, ugly sinners we really are. But equally and more importantly, you would help us to see what a great savior Jesus is. For his blood on Calvary's cross paid every debt of sin that I have or ever will have. Help us to leave this place today humbled and grateful for who you are and for what you have done. And may we never, ever, ever, ever be the same because of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, we've got a great journey ahead of us. Hope you show up as we take it step by step along the way.